Dream Interaction has been my even bigger success than the first album. And I, I was, I, I never, ex you know, I was terrified that it wouldn't be, but it, it just, you know, it, 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 it went really well. So I suppose I was a little bit more confident um, after the success of Dream Into Action going into One to One and that I could, you know, I could go off piece to, uh, a bit and I didn't have to stick to, ex you know, all the things that had been successful. I didn't, I could do, I could open up a new chapter, you know, um, and I was a huge fan of of Scritti Politti and what and what they just done and they'd worked with Arif Mardin and I, I I thought oh I'd really like to make a record that was a bit more like that very electronic but kind of, kind of dancey and and cool um, and so yeah so that that was that was where I was I, I you know we were really busy the whole time doing stuff but. I was very excited about writing for the new album, so I, I, you know, I was in a good place for it. Probably better place than I was for writing Dream Into Action because uh, there was a bit more confidence there. You know, to be honest, I think that um, the UK didn't get Dream Into Action um, in the same way as the Americans did. The Americans really got that album, and it was, you know, top ten album in America, and loads of singles from it that did well. Whereas the UK, it all, you know, it was mainly Humans Lib, which is the biggest record here. And, but I'm not thinking about that at the time. I'm just thinking, I want to make great records. I don't really care about that. You know, I don't care about any kind of strategy. I just want to make great records with people and learn stuff and go out on tour and write music and play music. I mean, there's no other thought that I can look back on it now and go, oh, right, historically, you know. Obviously, I was looking at Arif's um, current work. You know, I knew that he was a legend, going back to working with Aretha Franklin and the Bee Gees and Three Dog Night and endless, amazing records. I mean, his CV was unbelievable, but I was looking at what he was doing with Chaka Khan and what he was doing with Scritti, and he just made a record with Boy George. And um, I, I was loving what, you know, what he did. I mean, he was in his 60s when he worked with me, and it was, but it was like working with a young man, the energy that he had. And you know, when I, you know, when I met him, and I knew I was gonna enjoy it. And it was going on a, another adventure with him, and it was just, I was gonna be in good hands, wasn't I? You know, the guy doesn't do bad records. <laughs> I'd love, I'd absolutely loved working with Rupert and Steve on Humans Live and, and, and Dream Into Action. And it was really, really successful. It was not only successful, it was just such good fun. So the obvious thing to do is to keep going because it, like this is a formula that's working. Well, we're doing really well with it. But actually looking back on it, I think that we did make the right, I did make the right decision to change because, you know, you need to have a broad education in how to make records. And the more sort of really talented people you work with, you get a different, you learn more things, you get a different perspective. And okay, you can stick with what, with, with what works, but really, I think it's 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 much more beneficial to to try different things, you know, and learn from because that's what I was about. Um, and I felt bad about not continuing with 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 Rupert and Steve. Actually, I did. I, I did. There was part of me that felt bad um, because I I loved them so much, you know. But at the same time, it's very exciting to be offered the chance to work with Arif Mardin and you know and go to New York and work with New York musicians and, you know, he's a legend in a completely different way from, from Roop and Steve. You know, another, another world. And so I think as a young man, I really, you know, did make the right decision to do that. It was, because um, I did learn a lot. I think the important thing to say is though, there was the whole bunch of technology that was affecting the way I was writing. 
because I just got hold of a Fairlight Series 3 and it cost like 60 grand, you know, which at the time was like an absolute fortune. And, and it certainly was a, a, a fortune from, you know, for me um, to invest in, you know, in a piece of kit like that. But it was the first sampling keyboard that was amazing. You could, I could sense that, you know, the potential. I'd loved all the stuff that you know, Trevor Horn was doing with sampling and his use of Fairlights. And I thought, oh, I really want to be part of that, you know, pioneering that sort of thing. And um, so I wanted it to be, you know, um, a record that used a lot of sampling. I wanted it to be a bit more dancey like Scritti. Um, and yeah, so I think the the writing was, was definitely more a kind of, adventurous and went in that direction. I was, I was at home in England, so I was able to write. I wasn't on the road writing this one. Um, and I was able to program it up um, in my studio at home, you know. So, so that was a lot easier for me. Um, writing on the road was like, t- it tastes tough. You know, you don't, you don't always feel in the mood. And, there's a good side to it. There's lots of energy involved, but you don't really know what you're doing. It's, you can't assess it very well. Um, but when you're at home, you can sort of, yeah. All of it was written before I went in the studio. Yeah, all the songs were done. I didn't, I didn't, I, I would have done, I would have tweaked things in the studio, um, but, um, but it, was all, it was all written beforehand. And I needed, I needed to do that because it would just take forever if I was writing in the studio, which I went on to do later on, you know, I mean, and it did take forever, but I had my own place and I could do that. But you can't do that when you're at Windmill Studios in Dublin. <laughs> yeah, I think it was pretty exciting to record there because it was U2's place and they recorded there. They had their rehearsal rooms um, in, in the complex as well. So, you know, that felt like, oh yeah, that's got a vibe. Um, and, you know, it's very exciting to go somewhere brand new and, and away from home and, and work, you know, in a cool studio. And Arif was really keen to do that. He was keen to sort of, you know, mix it up between um, Dublin and New York, which, I mean, you know, hey, you know, how cool is that? So. Um, yeah, very happy to be there. It had some great rooms there as well, where you could um, send, you know, put, put drum kits in, stone and iron, and get this incredible fat reverb, you know, that uh, Arif was really into and I was really into, you know. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was great being there. That was the first time for me to record um, outside of the UK, I mean, you know, um, well, I mean, Dublin, of course, but no, I'd never been into a New York studio and, you know, you sort of dream of that, don't you? And like working with really hot New York musicians and stuff. Um, so obviously it's a very exciting thing that I was, you know, I was camped out in the Mayflower Hotel on on Central Park, and we used to, uh, Arif had his, his apartment on Central Park, we used to go up to his place and he'd make us drinks, and you know, there was a whole social side of it as well. And going out with, you know, the, you know, Scritti Politi, going out clubbing with them, because they were in town, and going to a recording session of Chaka Khan when she was laying down vocal, you know, because Arif invited me you know, that sort of thing was like, wow, you know, you, you definitely want a bit of that, don't you? <laughs> um, yeah, so it's very, and you know, Nile Rogers being, you know, coming in and playing guitar on one of my tracks, you know, it's like amazing. I really, really liked Arif and really just, he's the sort of person, um, he was the sort of person that you just respected as soon as he walked in the room. And he was a very warm person. 
but very, very, very good ears and, very, and really knew what he was doing with grooves and stuff. So it was very plain to see that, that this guy really was um, an a, amazing producer. But, you know, as an artist, you know, you think, well, uh, but I still want to hang on to myself here, you know. I want it to be my record. I don't want it to be someone else's record, even though it may sound better being somebody else's record. I really mean that. It's got to be mine. And so I, when I look back on the time, I, I, I say to myself, I didn't really let Arith in as much as I, I could have, <laughs> you know, to sort of set the tone and set the direction. I mean, he was very involved in it, but I could have given up a bit more to his expertise. And maybe that would have been good or maybe not. I just don't know. But, you know, when you're young, you've got to fight for who you are, you know. You can't... So many, I saw so many artists being, like, taken over by by an amazing producer. Well, where, where's, their, where's their voice in this, you know? So you're looking for guidance and somebody who's going to stop you making big mistakes, but you don't want to be taken over. And I think I was probably a little bit too protective. Um, but, that's, but that's my perspective now. I mean, that's the, the, the quality of the man, because he did get that. And he, he stepped in when he you know, when he needed to and um, brought in great people. I mean, things like a little bit of snow, you know, he, um, he did the most beautiful string arrangement for that, which is what he's, you know, but it, and it was not a conventional arrangement. It was much more from the jazz world. And he brought um, his friend, you know, Gary Burton in to play uh, vibes on the track, you know, I don't think many other people would have been able to call on those people, on that, that sort of calibre of person to play on a pop record. But Arif could, and it was just the right choice. And um, so it was like sort of a fatherly guiding figure, you know, and, he, and yeah, he sensed that I, I didn't want to be overwhelmed. You know, he can make a record without me being much there, you know, I just come in and sing sort of thing. I've written the songs. But he knew I wasn't that kind of artist. I wanted to be hands-on pretty much the whole time. And, um, but, uh, and, he, and yeah, he was great. What a, you know, I really have a lot of affection for him, you know, still. In terms of, you know, he's all about the groove. And when you listen to the canon of work that he's done, you know, everything grooves so well. And, I've never seen anybody do this before, but he would, because we were recording onto analog tape. And when we were laying down the drums and Steve, Steve Ferroni played most of the drums. And he would be there measuring, um, you know, the distance between the snare and the bass drum to make sure it was mathematically in the pocket, you know. And then he, if it wasn't, he would, he would edit the multi-track and, I've never seen anybody do that. He was so skilled with tape editing. I've never seen anybody like it. I mean, he did some amazing 12-inch remixes um, with us, with doing, well, you know, like scratching. And he was a master with... I thought, wow, you know, I mean, I just let him go on that, on that stuff. Um, yeah, no, it was great. And also, you know, we were going for big, fat drum sounds like... Um, was the language of the day, you know. We were trying to be keeping up with it all. And, um, you know, he was just amazing with all that stuff. Kevin Killen was, was, was engineering the album and, and obviously that was great that he, he was Irish. So we were recording in Ireland. And he'd just been working with Peter Gabriel, you know, um, and was incredibly cool head to have in the studio, you know, very, very um, calm person and very meticulous about everything. So he wouldn't let anything go through that wasn't 100% top quality. At the same time, he wasn't all stressed out, you know, he was chilled 
and organized. Perfect for us lot. <laughs> I was very pleased with the way it turned out. You know, I, I think it's a great album, um, you know, from my perspective. And it was a, a step forward for me, um, learning how to make records. And it was, it was very much of its time. Um, you know, I think, yeah, I mean, you know, it's the third album, so it's a tricky one, isn't it? Are the record company gonna get, are gonna, you know, they've done well, they've, they've done well with your first two albums. Are they going to put their throw their weight behind this one or not? I mean, you know, it's, again, it's not the sort of thing that I'm, th I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about going out on the road. You know, we we were playing Madison Square Garden on that tour. You know, and you know, some, uh, and the Forum in LA and Albert Hall in London, and that's where my head's at. I'm not really thinking about strategic <laughs> things. Um, and I, I, I don't know if they chose the right single. I think All I Want probably wasn't the right single, but I think it's a great track. But I think You, you Know I Love You, Don't You, which was the single in America, did much better. Um, but there wasn't like, I suppose, a stack of singles like there was on the first two albums, um, obvious ones. Um, so, you know, so it wasn't quite so much for them to work with. And I think that's fair enough. I, I, I have no problem with that. I, you know, looking back, you know, subconsciously did not want that kind of level of spotlight on me my whole life. I didn't want it because it's just takes your brain away. You don't want to be that famous, kids. <laughs> you don't. Um, you want to have a life. I mean, and I, I want to, just get on doing my music, be successful enough that I can do that. But I, do, I don't want to be a celebrity, if you know what I mean. I don't want to be, because it, you can't think straight in that environment. And I don't think, I don't know anybody who can. And there's many, been many casualties, as we've seen recently, from that kind of forensic, interest in your life, you know, and I think um, I didn't, uh, you know, subconsciously I've kind of realised I don't want to be that, don't want that my whole life. I've enjoyed, you know, this time of being really mobbed and, <laughs> and all that stuff, but a whole life of that, no, I don't think that's healthy for anybody. So at the time, you know, you, you want to keep everything, you know, we want to make sure everything keeps going and that it all doesn't just disappear overnight. And as I was saying before, you know, we're just about to do this massive tour and, you know, with a huge band and a huge crew and big production. And so you want it all to be, you know. But I think then after uh, One to One, um, then things did settle down, you know, into more of a, a manageable life for me, you know, where I could, I had my studio at home and I could just get on with making records. And, and so One to One was a, you know, was a turning point, I think, uh, in that, in that, you know, it was, it was the end of the really, the big spotlight days. And that was, that was getting on with my, my career and my work, yeah. Well, I think, I, I think One to One is, is, is a really, um, you know, I, 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 you know, I love all the albums that I've put out, every single piece of music that I've put out on an album. Um, I, I wouldn't let it go through unless it was, I really liked it. And so and One to One is no exception to that. I think things like Don't Want to Fight Anymore, you know, is a fantastic piece of work. Um, and it's, it's got elements of jazz in it, and it's got elements of, um, you know, funk and an urban influence. And I think it's a bold record, really. And we were using all the new technology, you know, to to make it uh, with a legendary producer. So I think 
it's a nice mix. I'm really, really proud of it, yeah. <laughs>